history fans and welcome back to the podcast that helps you learn a little bit of history. It's Women's History Month, so each week I'll be doing a roundup of the week's worth of women I've been talking about. For those of you just listening, I'll play the short video I posted on Instagram and TikTok and then we'll expand. So if you are listening, don't forget to follow the podcast and download so you can listen on the go. And if you're watching, please do subscribe and leave a comment letting me know who your favourite woman from history is. Let's get on with some history. It's day 18 of 31 days of women's history and this is No Man's Land Common, the place where the wicked lady Catherine Ferrers was shot, supposedly. First though, I wanted to rewind for a second and show you Margate's cell house, which is where she once lived, but I pulled up to the gate and it looked like this. So I thought maybe not, and I'll just pop in a picture here so you can see it. <laughs> Her parents were favored by King Henry VIII and Edward VI, who bestowed upon them vast estates in Hertfordshire, which she then inherited when all the male relatives in her family died. Make the best of a bad situation, I suppose. We got a big inheritance. But her mother decided to remarry Simon Fanshawe, who was a royalist supporting Charles I in the English Civil Wars. But he decided that Catherine should then marry his nephew, Thomas. So those men then took control of the estates. Now, Thomas is described by the famous historic diarist Samuel Pepys as a witty but rascally fellow without a penny in his purse. So you can imagine what happened to her fortune. And this is where legend tells us that because her husband was dwindling away her fortune, she turned to highway robbery, murder and arson, all very extreme things that give her the nickname the Wicked Lady. She would dress in men's clothes to complete her robberies and it's said to be here that she met a fellow highwayman, Ralph Chaplin, who had a great influence on her. By great, I just mean he had a lot of influence on her. It's said that during a robbery one night here at No Man's Land, she was shot, but she did try to ride her horse all the way back to her secret hideout at Margate Cell, which I believe is that way. It's said that people have seen a figure riding a black horse across this common at night. Of course, this version of the end of her story is disputed because she's only called the Wicked Lady after her death. And it's possible that she's just been confused with Robert Shirley, who was the Wicked Lord Ferrers. But you can read more about that in the comments or hopefully you'll hear about it in the podcast next week. And I am now going to go before that ghost horse and highway woman gets me. Goodbye. Everyone thinks they know the story of Dick Turpin's highway glory, but my past is far more gory, was no saint. We started the week with Catherine Fair as the wicked woman, or supposed wicked highway woman. Oh, and No Man's Land is a sort of huge field near Wheat Hampstead. Um, for the audio listeners, that's where I was in the short video just then. So like I said, she was made the sole heir of her family's estates, but then her mother remarried Sir Simon Fanshawe and things went wrong. The Parliamentary Sequestration Committee in 1643 meant that estates of the Royalist, which he was, went to the hands of the local commissioners, which somehow then meant that when Catherine married his nephew, he gained control of the estates and quickly dwindled the assets. So, according to legend, she turns to the wicked lady, possibly to gain some money back or just out of boredom. As I said, in this version, she was shot on No Man's Land Common and died of her wounds whilst riding back to the secret hideout. The only thing that definitely happened was that she died in 1660 at just 26 years old, ending the Ferrers line, with Thomas selling off the estates to settle his debts. The stories, of course, are speculated and no contemporary records are said to give Catherine the attributes of this wicked lady. And the comparison only came after her death. And there's no mention of her in Alexander Smith's complete history of the lives of the most notorious highwaymen in 1714. I also misspoke somehow in the short and it's actually Lawrence Shirley that she is likely to have been confused with as he was the wicked Lord Ferrers of no relation but he was the last to be hanged in 1760 for murdering his steward. There's also no mention of her apparent highwaywoman career in the history of Hertfordshire from 1870 which tells us that there's no mention before either and that her highway robbery is only mentioned after the execution of Lord Ferrers and then she gets named the wicked lady. So honestly, where this rumour came from is a bit baffling, <laughs> but for those of us who sometimes like a bit of myth or romanticisation of history, 
Hers is a good story, but for the factual historian though, it's probably sadly not true. So let's move on to another collaboration video, this time with TK, who you'll find on Instagram as For the Love of History. It's day 19 of 31 Days of Women's History and today we're talking about one of TK's favourite women from history, Tomoe Gozen. I love Tomoe Gozen for so many reasons, but the main one is that she completely changes the narrative of what and who a samurai really is. Tomoe was a Japanese female samurai who lived in the late 12th century who was known for her skill in archery and swordscraft. Warrior women like Tomoe Gozen were known as Ona Musha. They were offensive fighters who could be found leading troops and fighting on the front line. One of her favoured weapons is said to be the Naginata, which was a curved blade that by the 16th century had become symbolic for female samurai. She has so many legendary moments, like in 1181 at the Battle of Yokotogawara, where she defeated and beheaded seven samurai and then mounted their heads as trophies. In her final battle, she beheaded the famous strongman while surrounded by 30 enemy warriors. But after the battle, it's not known what became of her. Samurai women are almost always ignored when talking about Japanese history, but thanks to new discoveries and DNA testing, archaeologists are finding that samurai women were no strangers to the battlefield. Now, I knew nothing about Tomo, and I don't know much Japanese history either, so this was super interesting to learn about. And a warrior woman? Come on, we love those. TK has done a full episode of her own podcast on Tomo, so I will link that in the description below, as that's going to be the best way for you guys to learn about this brilliant woman from history. So go listen to that podcast. <laughs> Next, we have a video with Erica, who you'll find on Instagram as Moan Inc, meaning modern ancients. It's day 20 of 31 days of women's history, and today we're talking about one of Erica's favourite women from history, Aspasia. I have loved Aspasia for the longest time, and it's probably because Aspasia is somebody who had to work her way up from the ground. I mean, she was a foreigner in ancient Athens during a period where that was not necessarily welcome. She came from Miletus, which is in Asia Minor in Turkey, goes to Athens and makes a name for herself, not only based on the fact that she was incredibly personable and people really loved having her around, but also because she was incredibly, incredibly bright and smart. And so it meant that the elite of Athens were completely taken by her, despite her not being in a job that you would assume would mean she'd be very popular. Aspasia was an important part of Athenian society in the 5th century and was a mistress to the general Pericles as a well-known hetera, hetara, a prostitute for the rich. But she is well known and loved for being funny as well as clever. In fact, it is Plutarch that tells us that Aspasia had an unbelievable amount of political expertise. Socrates tells us that Aspasia was actually the one behind every single one of Pericles' great speeches. Well, we all know behind every great man is an even greater woman. There are so many things to say about Aspasia, we couldn't possibly do it in one video. But in case you guys wanted a little bit of a love story at the end of this, Pericles, the incredible general from this period of Athens, he supposedly fell so madly in love with Aspasia that he left his wife in order to be with her. Now, obviously this is under complete scrutiny. We don't know if this is 100% factual. And given that at the time there was a law in place that forbid Athenians, which Pericles actually passed, <laughs> but it forbid Athenians from marrying any foreigners from the city, any aliens who came into the city, so legally he couldn't marry Aspasia, but we do know that every time he saw her, according to Plutarch, he did greet her with a kiss. So, a very important woman, or the most important woman of the 5th century in Athens. She's found in many, many ancient sources, but the most notable are probably the Socratic Dialogues and Plutarch's Life of Pericles, which is the longest ancient biography of Aspasia. But as usual with ancient history, we don't really know if the life story told is completely true, sadly, with things like the nature of her relationship with um, Pericles being disputed, with modern and ancient scholars all saying different things. Some say she was a concubine, a wife, a prostitute, or a de facto wife. We don't know. 
but they did have a son together, Pericles the Younger. In ancient Greece, it's said that people knew her for two things, her involvement in the sex trade and her influence over Pericles. Two ideas that have been muddled together because the only surviving sources that mention Aspasia written actually in her lifetime are comedies and they all talk of ridiculous actions and muddle things up for us. If you did want to find out more though, Erica has an episode all about her on her channel, which is also linked in the description. Next we have a video with History with Megs. It's day 20 of 31 days of women's history and today we're talking about one of Meg's favourite women from history, Katerina Van Hemsen. Katerina Van Hemsen is one of my favourite historical women because she was such a pioneer and she's actually the earliest female Flemish painter for whom a verifiable work survives. Something I particularly love is how she was aware of the extent of her talent and how she asserted her identity as a woman artist. In her self-portrait here, we can see she's signed her name and the date. And in this portrait of a woman held in the National Gallery, we can see she's done the same in this top corner here. Born in 1528, she's the first known female artist that we have her works surviving that are signed and dated, as Meg just showed us. But just to be even more of a rarity, she also painted her own self-portrait, which has become the oldest surviving self-portrait of an artist. This was so important for art history as it began the tradition of self-portraits with added complexities that would change the way artists would continue to portray themselves. And she's even painting the painting in the painting. <laughs> Her father, Jan van Hemmersen, was also a painter and he likely trained Katerina when she was growing up. And this is one of his works here, titled Vanity. Between 1548 and 1552, she created eight small portraits and two religious paintings that survive until today. But of course, her most famous will always be her self-portrait, which she um, inscribed in Latin up the top. I, Katerina van Hemmersen, have painted myself 1548, her age 20. Some details of Katerina's life are fairly murky, but it does seem that she spent time in Spain with Mary of Hungary. The National Gallery have also found that most of Katerina's signed works are actually small portraits of women sitters, which I love. It's as if in signing these works, she's doubly asserting their worth in the representation of real women sitters and as artistic treasures to be proud of. As we said in the video, there's not much known about her personal life, so there's not really much for me to expand on, apart from please do Google her artwork, because the first self-portrait of an artist is really quite ghostly looking. And the most important thing to remember about her is that she was a trailblazer in art, with other artists following her example and painting their own self-portraits. The analysis of her paintings online is really, really an interesting read. And next, I went outside to Houghton House. It's day 22 of 31 Days of Women's History, and this is Houghton House, built in 1615 by Mary Herbert, the Dowager Countess of Pembroke. She starts life as Mary Sidney, and she's the granddaughter of Bess of Hardwick, who was an important part of the Elizabethan nobility. So she has a good start in life. In June of 1600, Mary was made a gentlewoman of the Privy Chamber to Queen Elizabeth I, and her sister was a maid of honour. So again, it's all going pretty well for her, and interestingly, her mother was the one who nursed Queen Elizabeth back to health from smallpox in 1562. She goes on to marry a much older man, Henry Herbert, who was the Earl of Pembroke, and she has a few children for him, which pleases him, and he seems to then just let her get on with whatever she wants to do. She has a laboratory built so she can study with chemists and botanists and she invites poets and writers over to do readings with her and she even becomes a writer herself with some saying she's the first female playwright in England and that Shakespeare stole some of her work, I believe, with Antony and Cleopatra. When her husband died he left her with huge amounts of money if she promised, if she promised never to remarry, which she doesn't. I know that wasn't a ghost and that was just the wind, but still, I don't like going in that house on my own. <laughs> she just generally seems to be quite well loved and popular in the Royal Tudor Court or Elizabethan Court. No one really says anything bad about her, which is ridiculously impressive. Apart from one rumour made up in 1600 that she was having an affair with a doctor that was believed to have just been made up by her least favoured son, so disregarded quite quickly, I believe. But just to bring the video back to Houghton House, King James I granted Mary this land in 1615 to build a hunting lodge. The work was then complete by 1621 when the king 
honoured Mary with a visit here. And it's a mixture of Jacobean and classical architecture, which I found really interesting. And the fact that James visited the house that late on shows that even at that point, Mary was still a well-connected member of the royal court. And if you did want to know more on the history of the actual house, I did a load of videos back in summer. So just scroll down my Instagram page a little bit and you can see them. Again, I kind of said everything in this short video. There's not loads and loads to expand on here, as I couldn't find loads of stories or sources either. One thing to boost the importance of, though, that I don't think I mentioned in the short is that she was the most important female writer and patron in Elizabethan England who wasn't a royal woman. She wrote a lot and avoided criticism by only writing within topics thought suitable for women. She writes about, or she writes, translations, dedications, elegies and encomiums, so a lot of literature style things rather than the controversial works that men were writing. I've once again put a link in the description if you want to know more about that side of her life. For the last two days I posted some photos with some fun facts in the caption. So, first we had Queen Victoria and the facts in the caption were she was originally the fifth in line for the throne, so it, wasn't, so it wasn't really expected that she would actually rule. Although one website I read said that she was born to rule on purpose because of the way the family line was, so I'm a bit unclear on that. And if you do know, let me know in the comments, because sources somehow were contradictory. I really didn't think that that would be something that was questioned about her lifetime. <laughs> But there's a slight succession disaster and she was crowned at 18 years old at the probably most infamous coronation where her ring didn't fit, some very, very old person fell over or down the stairs. She started to leave when it wasn't really over. Honestly, it sounded nightmarish. She should have also been Queen Alexandrina, but clearly preferring her middle name had it removed from all official documents, so they all called her Queen Victoria instead, her middle name. She was the first monarch to appear on the postage stamp and the first to live at Buckingham Palace. She survived 18 assassination attempts and she proposed to her husband, Albert, and it wasn't even a leap year, you know, because apparently that's when the tables turn and women are supposed to do it. And then I posted Elizabeth I and the facts in her caption were that her reign was known as the golden age in England because music, theatre and the arts were booming. Playwrights and composers were becoming really famous and there was even a royal troupe that entertained the Queen frequently called Queen Elizabeth's Men. She executed her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots. She rejected seven suitors and never married, saying that she was married to her country, even denying Parliament who attempted to force her to marry in 1556. She gave a rousing speech that inspired her men to destroy the Spanish Armada in 1588, and Virginia in America was named after her, the Virgin Queen, by Sir Walter Raleigh in 1585. And that very quickly concludes week four of Women's History Month. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed. If you're watching, please do give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening, please do follow the podcast and give it as many stars as you think I deserve. Thanks again. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.